Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchins. Welcome to another episode of White Tail Rendezvous. Who we're heading out to Central California. We're going to connect with the CEO of Hen Outdoors, Terry Ann, or some other people know her as Terry Irby. Terry, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you because you you have one um, a great woman voice both on social media and um, in your apparel lines, and you're doing a great job with your blog. So you're doing a lot of great things out there for the uh, women in the outdoors. So let's talk about how Hen Outdoors began. Um, well, I started Hen Outdoors as a Facebook page. And my intention of that was to connect with other women who are into waterfowl hunting because there's not a lot of girls around here where I live anyways that are really into that. And so it kind of, you know, evolved from there. and then. Um, I created a website for it. And then from there, we kind of um, went from just being a waterfowl, you know, a women's waterfowl company to catering to all outdoors women. So it's just an online destination for women to that they can get content that's related to them. There's apparel for them. It's just a women's world and kind of a man's world, if you will. That's great. And I know uh, from our warm up and other conversations that you've reached in three years, you've got about 50,000 people on social media that are connected to you. Uh, that's fantastic. And, and props to you for a job well done. So what's drawing the women to Hen Outdoors? Um, I think we like to have a lot of humor and just real life stories of of actual real women outdoors. You know, we don't Obviously, it's not based on anyone's looks or has anything to do with that, which, you know, some places it's like, you know, you have to have a pretty face in order to be highlighted. Like, I want to show real women from every walk of life and every background. And I think that's our main thing is just we want to be genuine and real with people. We don't. Oh, did you say something? No, no. I. You said genuine and real. I was waiting for the next. The next. Oh, I statement. thought it was frozen. <laughs> no, 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 we're good. You know, and so many times, and you alluded to it, if you don't have that pretty face, then you don't get a chance to to be be part of it. And, you know, I don't get that. And the biggest thing, and I'll jump into this right now, the biggest thing that I see uh, is that when I put up a grip and grin, I don't get bashed by other men. Some guys say, why do you kill such a small deer? Congrats. And boy, and that's going to be great, you know, great chili or whatever. But that's not so much in the women. Why Why do women attack other women so ferociously? I really don't know. I mean, when I first kind of started my hunting journey, I did notice that a lot. But I feel like nowadays women are sticking up for other women a lot more than they used to. Now, I, at least from my personal experience, I have a lot of men that attack me as opposed to other women that stand up for me. Um, the only time that I ever do see that is when it comes to African hunting. I know I've seen a lot of women bash other women over that. But from my personal experience, I don't really feel that women do it as much as they used to. Yeah, and that I, could um, be because there's a lot more groups and a lot larger of a community you know, there's other groups like Hen Outdoors, too. And I I think that's helping, if you will. So I don't know. At least not from my experience. I don't experience that. That's great. I had uh, uh, Jen O'Hara from uh, Girls With Guns on uh, a month ago or so. And and it just, you know, she was telling me some of the stories uh, because she does hunt Africa. And she takes kids to Africa um, through one of their foundations that she's involved in. And she said, you, you will not believe, you know, what, you know, kind of responses they get. And um, it's just, you know, I just don't see it on the guy's side. And for some reason, 
you know, women are doing it. But I'm I'm happy that uh, you're not getting that same response. And the ladies, you know, you're banded together. It's a band of women. Yeah. And don't don't mess with Mama Bear. I mean, <laughs> yeah. right? I will say there are a lot of anti-hunter women who do attack other women, and not since yeah, that happens a lot. <laughs> Yeah, but other hunters not so much. At least not from what I see. Well, that's great, and I, I'm happy with that. Where did your hunting tradition begin? How did you get into this game? Um, well, I actually didn't grow up hunting, so I didn't get into hunting until you know I think I was in my early 20s, and um, it all kind of started from a trip that I took to Colorado, and I stayed with a family of big time elk hunters, and the father there he kind of talked me through his tradition of hunting and why he hunts elk and how good the meat is and that they live off that meat for the entire year. And I was just like, wow, that's so amazing to go out and get your meat yourself. It's no different than gardening vegetables and being proud that you grew and are eating your own vegetables. So why should it be any different from animals, you know? So that's kind of how it all began for me. So then you came back to Central California and started duck hunting. Is that how it all started? No, I I started with deer and, you know, squirrels, raccoons, coyotes, things like that. And then it wasn't until I met my boyfriend. We've been together for about five years now. And he is super big into waterfowl hunting. So that's how I got introduced to it. And now it's just I've taken off with it. And here I am. <laughs> What's what's some of the tips that you give um, women that are just starting out? They'll reach out to you and go, Kari, you know, I'm just starting hunting. You know, what do I need to do because I want to hunt, um, you know, I want to hunt mule deer. You want to hunt what? Mule deer. Um, it's so, I don't know. The, I would just say go for it. You know, it's just don't be afraid. And my biggest thing that I try to tell women is don't be afraid to be the new person. Don't be afraid of not knowing anything. I feel like, and I am guilty of it too, when I first started that I kind of was scared and intimidated to be that person that was absolutely clueless. And now I've discovered, just ask questions, you know, don't, don't be afraid to not know anything because you're going to look more, you know, you're going to look like a weirdo pretending like you know everything and not knowing what you're talking about, then just use it as a learning experience. And that's, that's something I had to really change about myself is to admit, hello, I don't know everything and don't be scared to ask questions. So that's I great. Guess that would be my biggest tip. <laughs> right. That's great advice. And um, how do people reach out to you? How can they get a hold of you? Um, well, on social media, you can message me through all platforms, and I'll be the one that's on the other end of the phone. Or you can go to henoutdoors.com, and we have our contact us page, and you can go through there. Now, how big is your company? You said you get an apparel line, and so you're branching out. Do you have other people working with you? Um, we do have some blog writers. Um, my brother actually helps me on the behind the scenes part of it as far as the website and he's super into technology so he knows a lot more of that than I do so he helps me a lot with that and um and yeah and I have some pro staff girls that that we go on hunts together and they help me promote it talk to me about your hunts that you're doing where you invite women from all over the country to come out uh, to California or go to other states and hunt how, do, how does all that work um, well, we've had a few outfitters contact us that wanted to partner um, for a women's hunt. And so um, we've been to Arkansas twice. We went on a waterfowl hunt and we went with another outfitter and did a snow goose conservation hunt. And we just recently got back from Maine doing a black bear hunt. And uh, each time it's been women from all over the nation um, at the bear hunt. We had a girl from Florida a girl from Georgia, another California girl, um, a girl from Rhode Island. So it's just such an amazing experience to not only meet girls from all over the nation that are just like you, but to be on a women's hunt. Because I know from my experience and from meeting and talking to other women that every time you go hunting, you're, you're the only girl. You're just surrounded by guys. 
you see guys out in groups together and how amazing is it to look and see a group of women by themselves hunting. So it's just something that's really neat. And I would recommend to all women, even if you don't come on a hunt with us to go and hunt with a group of women, it's so much fun. Well, let's give a shout out to where you went in Maine because um, from the pictures, the accommodations looked outstanding and you did harvest some bears. So why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, where you went, who you went with, and uh, what the hunt was like. Um, well, that was with Primitive Outfitters. Um, it's owned by Daniel and Katie White. And I mean, the lodge was just absolutely breathtaking. It was so pretty there. I can't even describe in words how beautiful it was there. Even if you don't go there to hunt, I would recommend just going there to stay in the lodge because it's just breathtaking. Um, they were so amazing, so accommodating. They have um, Van, who was at the lodge, he was helping us and he was cooking and like cleaning the lodge for us. And it was just, a once in a lifetime experience, I feel. Even if I didn't get a 540 pound bear, I would still absolutely go again because it was just so much fun. The girls were nice. I mean, I have literally nothing bad to say about that place. Now, did and you I, take the bear with a rifle or a, a bow, muzzle loader? That was my rifle. I used my 243. And everyone well, was telling me, don't take your 243. That's too small. I'm like, well, hopefully I'll get a small bear. And then, of course, out walks a 540-pound bear. <laughs> what happened then? Well, we it was actually our first hunt of the, the entire, I think we were there for seven days, six days. And that was our very first time going out and sitting in the stands for the evening. And I just remember sitting there and the, the whole time I was just thinking and praying to myself, like, please let one of these girls get a bear. I wasn't even really concerned about myself getting a bear. I just was sitting there hoping, please, someone shoot. So we know that someone got a bear. And um, the sun was actually starting to set. It started raining. And I was just sitting there on my phone trying to stay as still as possible. And next thing I know, I look up and I see it walking through the trees and my jaw dropped. I think I even might have whispered, oh, my gosh. As he came walking through because he was just so massive. The only way that I could describe him to people was it looked like um, a smart car. Have you ever seen one of those? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's what he looked like walking through the trees. And so I shouldered my rifle. And right as I did that, he had just got to the bait barrel and he stopped and he looked up at me. And so I just had to freeze. And luckily I was wearing a lot of face paint because... I'm not sure if he would have stuck around, if he would have just saw my face sitting there staring at him. Um, it felt like an eternity, but he finally looked away and, you know, looked back down at the bait barrel. And then, so I looked through him in my scope and all of a sudden he looked at me again. So now I'm staring at him through my sights and I just see his face and he's just breathing hard, trying to smell the air. He, like he knows something's there, but he's not quite sure, but the food got the better of him because he went back down to the bait barrel and I went to put my crosshairs on his vitals, but there was a tree blocking him and there was a pretty big gap between each tree, but he was just so massive that his vitals happened to be behind that tree. So I just thought, okay, I'm just going to wait and hold my crosshairs in front of him and hopefully he'll step out or do something and I'll be able to hit him and Sure enough, he took one step forward and I pulled the trigger and he just went barreling through the trees. And I, it was just, I mean, it sounded like a bulldozer just crashing through the trees. It was so loud. And all of a sudden it just, just stopped. And so I just kind of sat there like, oh my God, what <laughs> did I hit him? Did I, I don't know. And then he let how, I don't know if you've ever been bear hunting, uh -huh. but it, yeah, they, you know, their death moan that they do. And suddenly I heard that and I just thought, oh my gosh, he did the death one. That was my first bear hunt that I had ever been on. I had well, how do you know he was going to talk to you? How, how did he know well, he was going to moan? The, the outfitters, um, Daniel and Katie, they talk to us a lot about what to expect, their body language, you know, what they predict that they'll do. So they had told us about the death moan. And I, yeah, I thought it was going to be something that was, going to be a lot worse than it was but now it kind of replays in my mind in a, like in a good memory because I'll just never forget 
hearing that and knowing, oh my gosh, I got the bear. So what did it sound like as best you can vocalize it? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, well, luckily he only did it once, but it, I mean, all I just remember is hearing the the trees crashing and then it suddenly stopping. And then I just hear this, oh, <laughs> and that was it. And then it was just silence after that. Yeah. Because but yeah, I don't do I don't do a very good bear noise. So. That's okay. That's okay because you know that's that's the perfect scenario because obviously you took out his heart or you took out both his lungs. I mean, yeah. you just you destroyed him with a two forty three. So folks, tell tell us about the what the bullet did because a lot of people are saying oh it's too light a caliber for a bear and stuff. Um, people shoot him with bows and arrows all the time. I've killed bears with my rifles and I've killed them with my bows and arrows so it's just like yeah you hit them in the right place they're gonna die so yeah, tell exactly. us about the bullet performance um I mean I I double lunged him and nicked his heart so I don't I don't know if it ever exited out of him though so it, it must have still been inside of him but I mean he was he was pretty jacked up on the inside so I have no, no complaints about my little 243 <laughs> no and, and, and so he, Go ahead. He was a big boy. I mean, he when we cut him open, he had at least maybe seven to inches of just blubber. So he was pretty thick. So I'm I'm pretty impressed with my little 243. And what kind of bullet was it? Um, those were Winchesters. I know it was lead. We can't like a silver tip or silver. something like that, or yeah. So you don't uh, reload yourself? No. Okay. In fact, my my father in law had given me those, and I thought, well, what the heck am I going to do with these? We can't shoot lead here. So, and then I had the the trip coming up, and I asked them. I said, can I use lead over there? And they kind of were like, uh, yeah, because <laughs> I guess most states. California's California different. Really California's different, folks. Yeah. So let's let's leave it at that. Let's, yeah, let's exactly. And so they were like, of course you can use lead, not for waterfowl, but yeah, you can use lead. I'm like, okay, well. I guess I can use this ammo then. Yeah. And one thing about, you know, um, that 243, it took out its lung, nicked his heart, and left all the energy in the bear. Sometimes bullets will pass through and they don't expand. They don't leave all their energy uh, in, in, in the critter. And so that's excellent performance because I've been told and Hey, folks, correct me if I'm wrong. This is my opinion. But if it leads, if you find a bullet on the off side, inside the hide, then that's as good as the bullet could perform. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Did any of the ladies get any of the bears? How many of the bears did you get? Yeah. Um, so the next day we went out and um, Brittany, the other girl from, um, she's also from California. It was her turn. But in the morning time, we ran dogs. And so we ran, I think, until 6 a.m. until about 1 o'clock is when she finally, when they finally treed the bear because they, this bear would just not give up. And neither would the dogs, so props to the dogs. But um, about 1 o'clock, um, we finally got the alert that they had treed. So we jumped out of the truck, ran into the woods, and sure enough, there was a bear up in the tree, and she blew it out of the tree and that was her bear but unfortunately the other girls they didn't get a bear but i think they still had a lot of fun well it's it's it, it's the journey that counts and i've said that a lot of times to a lot of people you know because you go to some new places you met some fantastic people had great meals uh and developed relationships and that's what in my opinion that's what hunting's yeah. about um and you know um what did you do with the meat? Did you bring some of the bear meat home or did you share it there or what happened to the meat? Um, I ended up bringing home about two big ice chests full. I think they said that we got about 150 pounds of meat off of him. And um, I didn't, it didn't all fit into my two ice chests that I brought. And so I, um, the girl, um, Lindsay from Georgia or Florida, she brought it home with her. So she at least got to go home with some bear meat. Well, and earlier on in the Facebook Live portion, we talked about, um, you know, organic meat and organic. Everybody wants organic. And there's no better uh, meat to get than organic meat because, um, you know, range bred, free ranging. We have all the all the adjectives to what we hunt and um, the meals are fantastic. And 
let's talk about, we got a couple more minutes now. Let's talk about how you have seen women grow in the outdoors because of hen outdoors. Um, yeah, I just, I feel like it, the women are already in the outdoors, so I'm not necessarily looking to empower women because I feel like we're already empowered. It's just now we just need to be normalized, I feel, if that makes any sense. So I don't know. I just, it nothing is better to me than to support women and to share the stories of, of women outdoors. So I just feel like it's, I don't know, <laughs> maybe I'm not answering the question properly. <laughs> But um, what was your question again? I'm rambling. The women, the women that are following you, the fifty thousand some women plus or minus, um, they're there in your community for a reason. So how is Hen Outdoors helping these women uh, become more confident, become more uh, self sufficient? You just mentioned they're all empowered. They're already in the outdoors now. You know what growth do you see of the women that are part of your community? Um, I, I feel like, I don't know, why am I having such a hard time answering this? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I just feel like seeing other women outdoors kind of normalizes it for everybody. So just having it constantly on your news feed, constantly hearing stories and tips from other women, and just everything that I ever do is just from a woman, by a woman. I mean, I just really want it to be a world for women because it's just such a male-dominated sport, if you will. So I, I, and that's kind of a big reason why I wanted to do the apparel because it's not necessarily stuff that you are hunting. It's stuff that you can wear in your everyday life. So, you know, if you're at the grocery store, some lady can see you wearing a deer shirt and it's like, oh, wow, she hunts deer too. So, so it's just something that really brings women together. That's kind of been my whole goal is just to normalize and make it about real everyday life women. And if that, and connecting women, that's my big thing. I like that. Well said. That's well said. And with that, we're going to end this episode of Whitetail Rendezvous with Kari Irby or Kari Ann from Hen Outdoors, and you've just been a gracious guest, and, you know, I look forward to seeing your growth and continued success with your company and continue um, having a platform that women come and are part of your community and feel comfortable and, and do feel empowered and say, hey, we can do this together, and mm -hmm. that's what you're all about. I mean, you know, bringing women together and, 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 and taking the journey together. So well done, lady. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.